Long ago, in a land far to the east, there was a kingdom engulfed in chaos. There were no leaders, no rulers, no law. The land was barren and dry, and the people of these lands suffered in ignorance. Until one day, a king rose up. Not through war, but through divine right, he was seated on the throne above all others. He taught the people and led the kingdom out of chaos and into a bright future. He was everything that a king should be, kind, gentle, discerning, wise, and powerful, and his people loved and revered him. Now there came a time when the king was walking through his kingdom, and he came upon a beggar child in the street with no home or food to eat. The king took pity on her and accepted the child as if she were his own daughter. But the girl had a father. He was a righteous man, and the king embraced him as well and set him at his right hand. Over time, however, the father became enticed with greed. His lofty position soon became irreverent, and his riches seemed to him as rags. The king's power loomed above him like a dangling branch, and he longed to snatch it for himself. Just as the king's love grew for the daughter, so grew the father's greed. The weight of temptation grew so strong that one day, as the father was writhing in contempt, a seed spewed out of his mouth. Not knowing what else to do, the father planted the seed in a secret garden and watched as the plant grew. The tree became like a great oak and was planted firmly in the ground that it was on. As the tree grew, it began to speak to the father. The tree told the father that if he were to eat of the fruit that it would bear, then he would grow strong enough to overthrow the king. It soon bore the promised fruit and eagerly the father plucked and ate of it. The coup was short-lived. The father soon found that the tree had deceived him. For his attempted at takeover, the king stripped the father of his power and banished him from the kingdom. The king then declared the tree cursed. He said that it was the knowledge of good and evil, and that any man who touched the tree would surely die. Humiliated, the father began work toward his revenge. Knowing the king's great love for his daughter, the father enticed the girl into the wilderness while the king was away. He led her to the tree, and he let the tree whisper sweet lies into her ear. Being deceived just as her father was, she ate of its fruit vivaciously. At the king's return, he discovered that the girl had fallen deathly ill and that she had been deceived by the father. He quickly picked her up in his arms and ran to the cursed tree. He split the tree open and placed the girl inside, knowing that the wicked magic of the tree would prolong her fading life, although it would come at a great cost of misery to the girl. As punishment, the king summoned four great dragons and ordered them to consume the father. The dragon of the east swallowed his feet, the dragon of the west his torso, and the dragon of the north and south each swallowed his arms. The head of the father was left in the field where it lay. Over time, the head grew a new body in the likeness of the dragons that consumed it. Fearing the dragons would return again, the father disguised himself as a serpent and slithered into darkness, never to be seen again. For weeks, the king sat before the tree and wept for the condition of the girl, for he loved her above all things. The king's love became manifested into a seed, just as the father's had before him. The king entrusted the seed to a ruler in a faraway land named Yabo. However, the king did not return to his throne. Instead, he proclaimed that he was leaving to build a new kingdom and that his son would finish the work he started. This great son would overthrow the powers of darkness and bring the dead back to life. It was through this son that the tree would wither and the daughter would be healed. It was through this son that the new kingdom would come to fruition and be ruled. The king vanished, and years turned to decades, decades to centuries, centuries to millenniums, and the whole earth waited for the coming of the sun.
is still the earth, the spirit moved its honored in the darkest ocean, lingered like the smoke over the water, and up into the heavens, to the earth, there came a cry as it resounded out in glory, shouting, come let there be light, and so the red sun rises, the red sun rises, the red sun rises, the red sun rises. Lights and give dominion to the moon and let the land rise up and see that still the light shines in the darkness. Praise the light that made it be until the red sun rises. The red sun rises. The red sun rises. The red sun rises. Of the mighty sea, too numerous to count into the skies. The birds of free and seed on weightless wings, they mount as every plant, rock, and fungus comes erupting from the ground. So he gives every creature eyes to see and the voice to make a sound. Meanwhile, the red sun rises. The red sun rises. The red sun rises. The red sun rises.
And so it came to pass that the descendants of Yabo grew strong in numbers and became advanced in all manner of civilization. They established a new kingdom on top of the old and advanced it greatly through campaigns of war. However, though its stature grew, this new kingdom was feeble throughout. War had ravaged the country and its people, and outside the palace walls the country was starving. The seed that was given to Yabo by the great king was planted and grew to be a thorn bush. Care for the bush was passed down from generation to generation until it fell to Yusifu. Now Yusifu was a great warlord, but loved his family and his country very much. Every day Yusifu would go to where the great king's seed had been planted, and he would pray for the coming of the sun. One day, as he was lifting his head to pray, he heard a cry from beneath the ground. He dug furiously until he uncovered a little child, a baby boy. Knowing the great destiny of the boy, Yusifu raised him as his own, teaching him the ways of the old kingdom and of his father. However, Yusifu had one other son, Long Wan. Long Wan grew to be a wicked man despite the raising of his father. Being the eldest, Long Wan was in line to sit at the throne, but still despised the son's great destiny. For though Long Wan's future kingdom was great, he knew that the kingdom the son was to inherit would be far greater. The years passed, and Yusifu grew old. As he lay on his deathbed, he invited the son to come sit at his side. It was here that he told him of the great destiny allotted to him. He told him of his real father, of the great kingdom he was to rule, and told him of how it was to come. Before you sit at the throne of your kingdom, you must have for yourself a bride, said Yusifu. And your father has already selected the bride you are to marry. You will find her in a great tree at the center of the old kingdom. You will find her, and you will love her as your father loved her, for you were made for each other. Then Yusifu sat back in his bed. This world is fading before my eyes, he said, but I am not dying, for is not death merely the transition of life? The one who gives life takes it away and could give it back if he wished. Remember this, my son. I have suffered all my life for what? Grass, dirt, stones carved in my likeness. But you, you will suffer, not for death, but so you may live. Even when this world fades around you, you will live. Open up the doors and let the sun shine And there's no sense waiting in the darkness to be healthy Once again, cause no good ever came from tapping on the glass Till your fingers turn to rust Open up the doors, come on, what do you say? And if these bones indeed are brittle, then let's test them Till they break, until they shatter to the ground Return the ashes to their ashes, dust to dust Still ringing in my ears, I'm tired And after all these years I wonder Why we've done what we've done Rifle chamber, still smoking in my hands Old dangers from lost and foreign lands So keen they seem so near to me now Let the old man's resolutions come to pass And let the young man fall in ignorance Receiving what he asks But oh my son, do not be swayed by foolish means Which this world seeks its own end Come now, dreary death, come on and take my hand A wasted lifetime has been afraid of you But now I understand amidst the tossing waves of this old life You're not a foe, no, you're a welcome friend Smoking in my hands, old dangers 
sunburst of light if you could see what I could see right now you can't believe your eyes my son I think my time has come I hear the chorus and they're calling out my name Remember not my son the wars that I won and do not praise the thing I was instead the thing I will become cause any tear you shed for this past life so fear my son a tear you shed in vain Fire still ringing in my ears, and I'm tired. And after all these years, I wonder why I've done what I've done. Yusifu was buried in the tomb of his father's. Long Wan ascended to the throne, and the son departed to be about his father's business. He wished his brother well, and set out to the west, to the center of the old kingdom. The journey was long and treacherous, for the old kingdom was long abandoned and infested with thieves, robbers, wild beasts, and the like. The location of the garden was secret, and the son searched for many months in vain, until one day he came upon a weary, overgrown gate that read, Forward to beauty, forward to glory forward to death. The sun entered cautiously and walked for a while through the smog of flies and dead and dying plants until he entered a clearing and there saw what appeared to be a great oak. It seemed to be the only plant left alive in the garden, as if it were thriving on the downfall of the others. As the sun approached, he saw at the base of the tree the outline of a figure. As he approached further still, he saw that inside of the tree there lay a beautiful woman. She lay there silently, as if she were sleeping, and the sun stood over her, amazed by her beauty. It was as Yusifu had said. They were made for each other. It was love at first sight. The girl stirred and awoke abruptly. She peered back into the eyes of the sun for what seemed like an eternity. The two were made for each other. It was love at first sight. The son stepped forward and proclaimed his affections for the girl, announcing his position and plan for their future life together. The girl's eyes lit up only for a moment before they faded, and her countenance was downcast. I cannot go with you, the girl whispered, for I am bound to this great tree as surely as I am bound to my remorse. The son looked down and saw that the girl's feet were rooted to the ground at the base of the tree. I am doomed to abide in this tree and eat the fruit that it bears, for if I do not, I will surely die. Who has done this thing to you, asked the son. I have done it to myself, she replied, for I ate of the tree when it was cursed, and its fruit was enticing and delectable. But that was long ago, and now its fruit has become like ash in my mouth. It does not satisfy, and I am tormented always by my circumstance. The son felt a great sadness wash over him as he stared into the eyes of his beloved. Is there no redemption? Is there no salvation for you? No boomed a mighty voice from overhead. The sun looked up and saw that up in the trunk of the tree, a great eye opened and the tree began to speak. The girl was placed in my care as a result of her actions by the actions of her father, as only her father can release her. Where is this great father, asked the son, so that I may ask for his daughter's deliverance. The tree paused and peered intently at the sun for a moment. The girl's father, it replied, is five dragons, one to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. The fifth dragon is hidden and is a mystery to myself and the world. Then how can I find him, asked the sun. Receive your blessing from the first four dragons, and the fifth will be revealed, for each of the four has what the fifth desires. But be warned, the journey is treacherous. The dragons are mighty and cunning creatures, and the dangers between are great and many. The son looked back into the eyes of his beloved. I cannot ask you to do this thing for my sake, she said. I have brought this fate upon myself, and it is my burden to bear, and I fear you will not return. The son smiled and reached down to pick up his pack. He slung it over his shoulder and pointed far to the setting western sun. Though the darkness comes for now, as surely as it will rise again, so will I return to you. Can death stop the moon from waning or the stars from shining through the night? 
so my love for you goes on until I return.
star falls from its place when every beating heart is gone beloved no my love lives on The sun set out and decided to first seek out the dragon of the southern seas, Al Jin. As he went on his way, he began to doubt if he should ever find the dragons. He knew of the dragons, of their ability to change shape and voice, and knew not where to find one, let alone all five of them. Eventually, the path led him alongside a dark forest. The forest was ancient, and therein held a fallen kingdom of primates, once glorious in the eyes of men and beasts alike. As he advanced, he felt the presence following behind him. Show yourself, the sun shouted. Slowly, a figure emerged from the forest. The figure bowed low and said, Forgive me, friend. I have been following you, for I knew not whether you were from my kingdom. The sun glanced over the bleak forest and replied, Is this your kingdom, then? It is, the figure replied. The sun looked closer at the figure and noticed the painted mask on his face, the matted pelt that draped over his body, and the broken crown on his head. It was the Monkey King. From what the son had learned of the Monkey King, he was a vain, plodding, devious king who once ruled the mighty Monkey Kingdom. He lost his kingdom, his glory, and his eyesight during a campaign against the son's grandfather, in which he agreed to trade faces with the king, not knowing that the king was blind. He spent the years after his great fall skulking up and down the border of his once great city, and it occurred to the son, harassing travelers on the nearby road. The son did not wish to speak to the beast for long, for he knew that he was crafty. I have not come for your kingdom, replied the son. I'll be about my way. The monkey king halted him and approached slowly. Hmm, he said. Your footsteps sound like the walk of a nobleman. Have you some connections to royalty? Are you en route from the palace? No, replied the son. Just heading south. Family affairs, you see. Well, there are no families south of here, said the monkey. No remaining settlements at all, in fact. The sun could sense the monkey grinning as wide as his painted mask suggested. What is your real business, your highness? The sun looked plainly into the mask in front of him. I seek the dragon of the southern seas, Ao Jin. The monkey king paused for a moment and then replied, Ah, you seek to slay him and make a great name for yourself. No, I simply seek his counsel. Well, the blue crane isn't much for talking, but if you really want to find him, I may be of some assistance. You see, I once journeyed to find the four dragons myself. It took half of a lifetime, but I discovered their lairs, each of them. I would be happy to escort you, great prince, for I am an advocate of you and your kingdom. The sun was silent for a moment. He knew that the monkey king could not be trusted, but he also knew that he, like many, needed at least the chance of redemption. Either way, the Monkey King was knowledgeable of the dragons and of their whereabouts, and he would need the Monkey King's help if he was to find them. Very well, the son replied, and the two were on their way. As the two journeyed on, they came upon a small bean field, and there in a farmer who was tending to the beans. The soil of the field was dry and hard, and the beans were all in all pathetic to look upon. The farmer attending to the beans was a small man with a hunch on his back, and his left hand was shriveled. As they approached the bean field, the farmer turned and was greatly alarmed. He held his spade up like a weapon and asked what their business was in his bean field. The son told him, and slowly the man began to relax. As they talked, the farmer told the son that there was once a settlement here, but thieves and criminals had come and ravaged the town, taking the crops and food supplies. With the thieves left behind, the wild animals had eaten. Most of the town folk left to start new settlements, but the farmer stayed behind. 
He said that the thieves still often come and steal or burn the beans in his bean field, but he would not leave. When the son asked why, the farmer replied, This was once a great nation, and a great king once promised that it would be again. When his great son returns, how will he find his birthright? Will it be full of cowards and thieves? When the great son comes, I will give him a portion of the harvest I have reaped. And though they may be small in size and number, they will be great in his eyes. For these beings are the proof of my suffering, the fruit of my faith, and the last hope that I have for this nation. This is my field, my purpose, and I will not relinquish it unto darkness. The farmer's words moved the sun deeply, but before he could reply, they heard shouts ring through the distance. The criminals that the farmer had spoken of broke through the forest and stood in the midst of the three. The men advanced, the farmer held up his spade, and the son put his hand to his sword. Well, conditions out here are relentless at best what the jackals don't ravage, the insects infest. And the workers are few while the house overflows. And the enemy's rampant as none stand opposed. Bit of land that we found ourselves on was a bean field one time, but the beans are all gone. The results of an army retreating too long. Hear the enemy singing their victory song. with no grain to grind so put down your comforts and pick up your seat put the sun at your back and your face to the weeds cause our enemy chants to our left and our right it's a size of our fear by the whites of our eyes and they stole from our land as we washed from the shade and they sat on our backs as we all ran Our field and it's still worth. 
still worth defending. The two travelers ventured for weeks through the perilous slums of the southern countries. As they approached the lair of the dragon, the monkey king lingered. I will wait here, he said. The dragon's lair is up ahead, but I fear for my life should he discover me here. Walk a little further through the trees and you will find him. The sun proceeded through the trees and out onto a plain of stone. The fog around him was thick and he called out to the dragon. A great wind swept around him and in a noise of fury, the dragon arose from the smoke. He was in the likeness of a great crane and stood above the smoke, peering at the sun. What kind of urgency is this, the bird roared, that a mortal would seek his own death at the hands of a dragon? Urgent is my quest indeed, replied the sun, for I seek to marry your daughter, great dragon. I've come for her release. The dragon snorted, I have several daughters. Which is it you seek redemption for? The betrayer daughter, beloved of the great king, the son replied. The dragon heaved his head back and laughed. The betrayer daughter, surely a great prince does not seek the deliverance of a street urchin. I have abandoned that daughter to her doom. Any of my other daughters would make for a far better queen. As he spoke, the dragon's daughter stepped out of the fog. Here now, marry one of my other daughters. Why suffer for an unfaithful bride? Marry any of these daughters, and I will bless you above and beyond your promised glory. I will make you wealthy and establish your kingdom as far as your eyes can see. Cities and statues will be erected in your name, a name which shall be written on tablets of stone and never forgotten. Step forward and claim the bounty that is yours.
straight for your head, my friend, when he can't get your heart. And what you've learned in life, my friend, don't forget when it's dark. The son denied the dragon's offer. I will have her release, he said, putting his hand to his sword. If not by permission, then by force. Peace, said the dragon. As the fog cleared the images of riches and beauty away, the son saw that he was not in the middle of a plain, but on the edge of a great canyon. Had you stepped forward, you would have fallen to your doom. You have passed the test of faithfulness. You are a worthy suitor for my daughter. You have my blessing and her release. The dragon gave the sun an ancient arm that had been stripped to the bone and preserved. The sun bowed, thanking the dragon, and went on his way. The passage from the southern to the eastern coast was a far stretch, so the sun took the monkey king's advice and the two set sail on a ship working as sailors. The ship was to set sail across the Zhangchao Sea. During their voyage, a great storm arose. While tying a line, the sun was thrown from the ship and into the sea. The boat quickly drifted out of sight, and the sun was left adrift. He swam as far as he could, until in the tossing waves he began to drown. Suddenly, the sun was lifted out of the water on the head of a great serpent. The sun thanked the serpent for his rescue, and the serpent acknowledged in turn. The sun soon found that the serpent's name was Ja, named for his wisdom and authority by the great king, and that he was in fact on route to the eastern coast as well. The sun found the serpent to be good company, and eventually he divulged the true purpose of his travels. The serpent was surprised when the sun spoke of his true father, as well as the mention of his traveling companion. The monkey king is a conniving creature, he said. It would be well advised for you to part ways with him. I see good in him, the son replied, for my kingdom will not be one of condemnation to those loyal to it. Should he prove a true companion, I intend to reward the monkey king greatly. So be it, said the serpent. When the son spoke of the daughter and of her pitiful fate by the leading of the father, the serpent went into a wild rage so that the son thought he would be flung back into the sea. Once he had settled, the serpent explained that long ago he was friends with the young fisherman. The fisherman was poor but content, and became greatly influenced by the serpent and aspired to be like him. The two would often have adventures at sea, and they became like brothers. One day they came upon a baby adrift in the ocean. The young fisherman was infatuated with the girl and wanted to keep her, but Ja did not want the child to suffer in poverty, so he arranged for a kind nobleman to take the child. However, the fisherman stole off with the baby in the night. The serpent pursued him to the shore, but could pursue him no further. Every year on the day of the kidnapping, the fisherman would send word to Ja. The last message read that the two had been taken in by the great king, and that the fisherman had been promoted to second in command of the entire kingdom. After that, the message stopped. The dragon's tone led the son to realize the identity of the fisherman and the ill fate of the child. Once they reached the shore, the sun thanked Ja for safe passage, and the two parted ways. The sun found the monkey king in a nearby village, and they departed to find the dragon of the east. But the sun could not forget the serpent's tail. His resolve was strengthened, and with every passing day he ventured for her freedom, and her affections grew for him. Every 
day I'm more depressed It's hope he on his shoulder bears I'm trusting him, we're halfway there I won't let you go Won't let you leave Your only home is here Deep inside the jungle, through the moss and through the mist, there was a mighty monkey king who ruled his kingdom with four iron fists and spent most of his days atop the highest of his trees looking down upon the villages of men and wishing he could be as one of them. And so he sent his army out to go explore, till exploring turned to stealing, and then stealing turned to war, pillaging and plundering. The treasures they would bring made the monkey kingdom wealthy, and the monkey people sing. First to the monkey kingdom, there the monkey king Take all the diamond and give all the moon Shining things, we have sacrificed our son and daughters For the many lords, we will give them And now we have given them The monkey king convinced he was now wealthier indeed Than any ruler over man Still could not satisfy his greed And as he pondered what else he could gain To end his cruel disorder The answer came so the monkey court was called to order, as he said. These are tied up rides turned to putty in our hands, and I just match now day by day. Every way and every measure of a man, and yet this hairy scalp and snap is my disgrace for my final transformation. I decree. Bring me a thing. And so the monkey army ventured to lands unknown and brought the young and old and beautiful before the monkey throne. Though the costly work was tedious, the king would take his time examining each one, but still a worthy face he could not find, until a man wishing to spare his life said, I know what you dream, and this face that you are searching for is one that I have seen. He is noblest among us. He is tall and strong and fine, and he is loved by all the people, and is praised time after time, and he abounds in earthly wisdom, filled with kindness and with grace. The monkey king leaned closer, said, What of his face, boy, of his face? So a face that has no weak, piercing eyes of crystal blue and a chin strong and commanding, lips and nose that follow suit, and it's the face that men will follow, of which women love to sing. But the face in which I'm speaking of is held by the man king. Oh. The monkey order begged the king to end his long campaign. For if we go against the man king, we have more to lose than gain. But the king he would not hear it. So his army marched for days until at last they stood in silence before the old man city gates. And all the chimpanzees were restless. All the apes began to roar and all the orangutans were pacing from the treetops to the floor till the monkey trumpet sounded. And the battle so began, but it was fierce and it was bloody. Major casualties of monkey and of man. The siege lasted for days until they turned to weeks when the 
monkey king's own sons were killed, he still would not retreat. Till at last, the gate was broken, and the king led the last charge through all the streets up to the castle, through the fence in the courtyard, and as the monkey army stayed behind to gather pretty things, the king ran to the throne room and there found the young man king. It's true this face of yours is just as I have heard. Oh, a face that you have spoiled and a face that I deserve. So give it here, give it here. You've no right to call it yours. You will give it to me now or I will take it off by force. The man king sat in silence for a while and then spoke out of his refrain, said I will give it to you freely in the form of an exchange, for if you take this face of mine and leave me in my misery, I will not suffer long, but die, since I'll have not a mouth to you. And you must promise in this treaty your good word will not be lost, for when faces have been traded, neither one of us shall take the others off. Then cheered the monkey king, oh, what a deal indeed, for I can think no better punishment than for you to look as me. So with faces traded, the handsome monkey king he laughed and went to look at his reflection, but instead let out a gasp. Well, is it everything you dreamed of? Is it everything you wish? Cried the man king as his words spoke out through his new monkey lips. Was it worth all of your riches? Was it worth all of your sons? Was it worth the lust of power, the things that you become? The monkey army heard their summons from the monkey king, and so they rushed up to his aid amidst his frantic violent screams. And when they stumbled in the throne room, they were horrified to find him on his hands and knees repeating. When they came near to the lair of Ao Huang, the monkey king again stayed behind and let the sun proceed. In his past dealings with the dragons, they had prophesied that they would ultimately ring in his doom, and so he avoided them at all cost. As the sun walked through the forest into a clearing, he saw nothing, until a voice came from a nearby plum tree. The sun looked and saw a small cricket on the tree. Are you the son of the great king? asked the cricket. The son took a puzzled look at the cricket and asked, Are you the dragon, Ao Huang? Do not be surprised by my appearance, said the cricket. You will find that we dragons can change form, and sometimes choose one less deserving. But be warned, we are cunning, and my brothers often use disguises as a means to an end, whether that be good or evil. The son accepted the dragon's advice and inquired of his daughter's release. Ao Huang knew of the son's quest, for the first dragon made it known to the others. I will release her, he said, on one condition. Further into the forest, you will find a group of orphans. They are childish, ruthless, wicked, and dejected. Despised and abandoned by their own parents, they have banded together for survival. If you dine with them tonight, I will give you my release. The sun continued deeper into the forest and came upon a crudely made table with little chairs arranged around it. There was a rustling in the forest, and out emerged a group of dirty children, wearing stitched masks. They reeked of sweat and filth and were poorly behaved as they snarled and sneered at the sun. Eventually, they settled at the table, and the oldest of the orphans rose to speak.
the tree and prematurely fall into a fallen society. It's unfair. They threw their cares upon our backs and then threw away the memory like they threw away the trash. We were drowning in the gutters, swimming with the rats. You can tell the open mind that we ain't ever going back. It's politics. Who feeds them? The wealthy. Who feeds them? Just eating fat and oxen and don't think about who bleeds them. Every dog will have its day and every rhyme its reason. Every man will rise and fall just like the changing of the seasons. But not us on the cusp of being young and grown up. Several immaturities expanded, now they're blown up. We dabble in whatever wicked thing that's coming showing up. The Bible to escape the womb, but you'll be here a while. As hard as you try, you can't feel the feel of the spit in our eye. You were building your gates, looking down from the mountain. As we died of thirst, barely feet from the fountain. You saw how we moved and we talked in our culture. Flew down to greet us on the wings of a vulture. You played us a story with no resolution. You called us the problem, but gave no solution. You see the state, now the seat that you covet. As we stand between you and your beloved, you know the decision. So go on and choose. You got nothing to gain but your whole life. The orphans left, cheering and laughing, overjoyed at their new adoption, as the red cricket flew to meet the sun. Well done, he said. You have passed the test of humility, and so you have become like a child in heart and body. You are a worthy suitor for my daughter. You have my blessing and her release. The dragon gave the son the legs of the father that he had devoured long ago, and the son went on his way.
When the sun reached the rendezvous, the Monkey King did not meet him. He waited, but still the Monkey King did not show. Reluctantly, he went on by himself. As he ventured further north, the wind grew cold and icy, and he sought refuge from the snow. He turned, and he saw a great structure shrouded in the snow and night. As he came closer, he saw that it was a tower with a large wall around it. Near the top of the tower, a light shined through the window. He entered into the tower and climbed the vast stairs until he reached the top, where there was a great sound of bustling. A door was cracked, and a light shone through it. He opened the door to find a hulking mass of gears and pistons steaming away. The entire room was moving and shaking, quaking underneath the weight of the obscene amount of equipment that encompassed the room. And standing in the middle, a creature made of iron and steel. The creature turned and looked at him inquisitively. Hoping the creature was friendly, the son stepped forward and introduced himself. The creature continued looking, and then greeted the son, who soon found that the machine was actually quite hospitable. He made the son a warm drink, and the two began to converse. After some time, the son inquired as to what exactly the machine was, and how it came to live in this tower. The bright lights of the creature's eyes dimmed slightly, and it seemed as if he could not recall how he came to be in the tower, or even how he came into existence. The gears around his head began spinning out of control, and suddenly, he was able to recall, as he told the son his tale. I was not always this machine you see before you, he said. I was once a man, an engineer in fact. Long ago, I was wrongly accused by my neighbor of a crime I did not commit, and under false evidence I was convicted and sentenced to serve time in Chowtu prison. Now there was a girl that I was to marry, whom I loved very much, but she was from a wealthy family, and the only bride price that I would be able to present would be one that I made with my own hands. I convinced her father to give me her hand, under the condition that I built for him a machine unlike any before. A machine of a grand design and build, worthy of what it would produce. But my fate was sealed, and she moved on to marry another. After the disappearance of the great king, when the kingdom was thrust back into chaos, the inmates of Chaoju prison overpowered the guards, and we all escaped as free men. But when I returned home, I found that my fiancé had married the neighbor that had accused me, for he was wealthy and exchanged great riches for her hand. This betrayal was too much for me. Desperately, I returned to the prison, my only home, and began constructing the bride price, hoping that its fulfillment would turn back the hands of time and allow me to reclaim my lost love. As the years went on, I grew old, and it became necessary for me to replace members of my structure with more permanent materials of steel and iron. Ultimately, I became the machine you see before you with only a beating heart as a remembrance of my old body. I have worked so long that I have lost track of time, feeling, I'd even forgotten what I was working for. The engineer hung his iron head and began to make a noise that the son supposed would be weeping. What was the machine supposed to produce? asked the son. Joy, the engineer whispered. I was to build a machine that would produce full joy.
lost its meaning when did all your harmless dreaming turn to self obsessive scheming in the end oh engineer you labor long enough you'll find you tear your kingdom down for mine and where you search you will there find your just reward The engineer was pleased by the son's request, and knew that from then on, if he were to build, he would build for a kingdom that neither rot nor rust would destroy. And so his labor was at an end, for the engineer found true joy. The engineer told the son that he had heard long ago where the lair of Alshun was, and as they said goodbye, he directed him toward it. When the sun reached the frozen coast, he saw a cave in an island of black ice. As he approached it, the island shook and cracked, and from the cave there came a massive head. The sides of the island sprouted legs, and a booming voice rang across the tundra. Alshun, the black tortoise, spoke. You have come for the release of my daughter, asked the dragon. I have, replied the son. The dragon peered at him with his giant eyes and let out a deep groan. But you are merely a child. How can you receive her? The son looked down at his small hands. I became like this in my dealings with the dragon of the east. I did not ask how you became a child. I asked how you would receive my daughter. The son stopped and thought for a second. I'll wait, he said. I will wait for her. Will you suffer for her? asked the dragon. Yes, the son replied. The dragon began to recede back into his body as walls of ice began to grow around the boy. Very well then, said the dragon. You shall wait twenty years until you are of age to receive my daughter. Should you wish to leave at any point, simply ask for your release, and you will have it. So you're sad in the morning and you're sad in the night There's the sun through your window but you're shy from the light But darling, don't worry and darling, don't fear These walls aren't so sturdy after two thousand years The cracks are a-growing and the walls are fine That they'll shatter to pieces soon All you need is time Fortress they built over throws and surrounds on the inside they whisper saying don't make a sound Cause they can't hear your worries and they can't hear your calls Cause we built thick and sturdy these black cement walls And your life is assigned you, you'll spend all your days In the hole that we carved with our previous slaves And you'll service them one, two, three, ten times a day Till there's no voice to cry out and no soul to say But don't listen my darling, can't you see through their lives There's a dove here descending right in front of your eyes And there's light that's a grown and the darkness will fall When our God comes a blowing down these cement walls and time Darling, don't worry and 
darling, don't fear these walls Aren't so sturdy after two thousand years And you dealt in the sadness and suffered, it's true But hope comes from the one who has suffered for you He has suffered for you, he has suffered for you Hope comes from the one who has suffered for you He has suffered for you, he has suffered for you Hope comes from the one who has suffered, has suffered for you Once the son was free of his prison, he found an icy arm in the snow. The voice of Al Shun rumbled from far away. You have passed the test of long suffering. You are a worthy suitor for my daughter. You have my blessing and her release. The son continued westward and eventually found the monkey king in a roadside village. Upon their meeting, the son discovered that though he had spent twenty years inside of the ice prison, the world outside had only proceeded a few days. The Monkey King showed the son two wanted posters, one for each of them. The Monkey King said that he had been trying to find the son since they had separated, but he was chased by Imperial soldiers. He said that the son's stepbrother, Long Wan, had issued a warrant for their capture. The son was dismayed by his brother's deterrence, but glad to hear of the Monkey King's diligence and loyalty. Because of the warrant, the roads were too dangerous, and they would have to take the passage through Haimang Valley to the west. Haimang Valley was a path unchanged by men since the beginning. It's where darkness lived and bred. The valley was evil, and any man who ventured in never ventured out. Long before, it was discovered that the journeymen who went into the valley were changed from their former selves into something terrible, something as evil as the valley itself. These creatures fed on the flesh of others, and from their feasts the victims would be reborn in the form of their attackers. Nevertheless, the passage was the only way. As they neared the entrance to the valley, a bird flew alongside them and began to sing. Its tune was strange and sounded awful to the Monkey King, but to the sun, the tune was warm and welcoming. The sun encouraged the bird and gave it a bit of bread from his bag. In a violent burst of fire, the bird became a beautiful woman before their eyes. The woman's hair was wrought of fire, and it crackled and burned atop her scalp. Son of the great king, why do you enter the Haimang Valley? For surely you will be turned into a creature of darkness, she said. I go to free my beloved, replied the son. The phoenix looked at the son for a moment. Then your quest is true, she said. I will accompany you through the valley, for I was placed here by your father to help any that may go through. The sun looked into the valley, then back at the phoenix. Why, then, have so many perished in the valley, he asked. I cannot help a man unless he will have me as a companion. But many men hear my tune and reject it. For I am Feng Huang, the righteousness of the great king, and my song is sweet. But in the shadow of the valley, temptations are many, and my song holds no weight and pleasure. And so the three went through the valley, and as the path grew darker, Creatures of darkness began to surround them. Feng Huang began to glow. Eventually, she burst into flame, but encouraged the travelers not to worry, but to keep their eyes on her, lest they be lured in by the creatures. No matter what, she said, keep your eyes fixed on me. Child of beauty, sing by morning. Child of fire, burn by night. Lest the darkness fill your heart with heavy sin. Brazen embers here adorning. Echo smokes unwavering cry that from the ashes you will rise to burn again. Follow me. When 
the darkness calls me forward when the darkness calls my name be my righteousness by light will be my holy burning flames a child of beauty sing by morning child of fire burn by night bless the darkness fill your heart with heavy sin brazen embers here adorning echo smoke some wavering cry that from the ashes you will rise to burn again As they approached the lair of Alji, the Monkey King did not stay behind, but instead went in with the sun. I've come this far, he said, so we will go in together. The sun was glad to have him, and the two ventured into the cave of the White Tiger. They entered the cave, and the dragon stepped out of the shadows to greet them. He had the body of the tiger he was named for, but his head had three faces, each blank and expressionless. What test am I to complete? asked the sun. No test, replied the dragon for the time for tests has passed. As he spoke, his faces changed into faces that the sun had seen before, one of the farmer, one of the orphan, and one of the engineer. You know all of the faces here, said the dragon. One of them is not what they seem. One of these have lied to you on your journey and mean you great harm. It is your life that hangs in the balance. To choose correctly is the difference between life and death. Think hard, prince, and choose wisely.
Sweating bullets till you bleed The gunshot of Gethsemane rang out In one last final plea Oh, that this cup be passed from me Of closest friends there lay the three But hearing not their Savior weep For all were silent, fast asleep As roaring deep cried out too deep Who spoke of I know which is the imposter, the sun said. Very well, said the dragon, which is it? The sun turned to face the monkey king. Brother, why have you betrayed me, he asked. The monkey king, knowing he had been discovered, answered, Your brother has offered a hefty sum for the location of your beloved and for your capture, for he cannot kill you in right standing with the law. But your beloved is sentenced to death, and he intends to carry it out so that you may not reclaim your future kingdom. And what could he have offered? Do you not know that I would have given you power and wealth in my new kingdom? These are of no use to me, the monkey king cried. Too long have I wallowed in blindness behind this mask. Too long have I fumbled in the dirt of my once great kingdom. I will have power and riches, prince. But above all, I will wear the face of royalty. For I will have your face. The monkey king flung himself at the sun, but before he could land the blow, the dragon stepped forward and killed him, therefore sealing the prophecy. The sun stood for only a moment and grieved over the body of his wayward comrade before turning to the dragon. I must defend my beloved from my wicked brother, he said. What of the fifth dragon, replied Algy. There is no time. I thank you for the warning. Without it, I surely would have chosen death. The dragon gave him the chest cavity of the ancient father and wished him well with his release and blessing. The sun rode off, and once the sun was out of sight, the dragon whispered to himself, You've made the correct choice, prince, but you've chosen death, for the two walk hand in hand. The sun rode for miles and miles to the point of exhaustion until finally he returned to the tree where his beloved waited. She greeted him warmly, but their sweet reunion was short-lived as he quickly explained that his brother was coming to kill her. She looked down at the ground where her feet were planted. I tried, he said, but I've yet to pass the test of the final dragon. It is not your burden to bear, she said. You must leave. I have betrayed your father, the great king, long ago. It is my sins that have bound me to the tree, not yours. You must flee before he arrives. I would rather die than remain in this misery. Leave me, for I am not worthy of your love. As she was speaking, a voice came from the garden. Brother, I have come to claim the payment of your great father. The judgment for her actions are death by order of the king. Step aside so that she may be judged. Long Wan stepped out of the trees with the steadied bow in his hands. Before the sun could reply, the arrow was let loose through the air, and the daughter was doomed. But instead of moving, the sun stepped further into the path of the arrow so that it struck him through the heart. The shot was true. The daughter was spared. 
and the sun collapsed, slain. Long Wan laughed. Fool, he said. I could not have killed you in right standing of the law, but now you've chosen death for yourself in place of a criminal, and so my revenge is complete. As he spoke, he began to change shape, and his face changed into the face of the ancient father, and his body grew slender and scaly until it was a serpent. For now, the son of my enemy has been slain, and the promised kingdom is no more, he said. It was then the daughter realized that Long Wan had been her ancient father in disguise all these years, and that he was indeed the fifth dragon. What test, she whispered. The dragons are to test the sun, so what test has this dragon given? The daughter looked down at the body of the sun in disbelief, until suddenly the tree behind her began to crack and groan. The leaves of the tree turned gray and fell from their branches, and the trunk began to shrivel and curl. The ground beneath her grew soft, and she pulled her feet free from the soil. It was then that she understood. She turned to face her deceiver, and he glared back at her eyes wide in disbelief. No, she said. My beloved sleeps, but not in vain. You're right, Father. The price has been paid, and I have been set free, and the curse of the tree of knowledge is no more. The source of my curse was the source of your power, and now the cursed tree is dead. So tell me, what power do you have now? See the remains of your old body that my beloved has collected. They are the remains of your first destruction, your mortality, and the proof of your destruction that is to come. As she spoke, the bone vanished from the ground and appeared in place of the serpent body. The father let out a piercing scream and then lay silent. The dragon king lay defeated. The son lay slain, and the daughter stood redeemed. As she looked down at the son, she was reminded of words that he had spoken to her long ago. When bitter and, and earth embrace, when every star falls from its place when every beating heart is gone beloved know my love lives on I'll keep my eyes on that horizon I'll keep my loving heart steadfast What wondrous sight I'll
from its place when every beating heart is gone beloved no my love lives on The journey of the five dragon daughter took three years in all. The son had passed the final test of love through sacrifice unto death. The daughter was saved, and the same love that led him to die brought him back to life. The daughter was now his bride, and together they would live and rule in the new kingdom that his father had prepared. But first, the guests were arranged, the feast was prepared, and wedding bells rang loud through the kingdom. Son, a mighty work now we've done. Take your bride now by the hand. Let's complete my blessed plan. 